a man must realize that he indeed consists of two men. One is the man he calls I, and who others call Uspensky. The other is the real he, the real I, which appears in his life only for very short moments, and which can become firm and permanent only after a very lengthy period of work. In the first tutorial of this series, we described consciousness as a quality separate from functions, an awareness that can observe and govern the microcosmos. As we verify the functions of our microcosmos, the four lower centers with mechanical, emotional, and intellectual parts, we begin examining each of them from the point of view of consciousness. Which of our functions can aid our aim to be? Which is indifferent to it? And which opposes it? In this tutorial, we will explore this question. We will draw from the San Marco creation of man out of dust and spirit. Dust, representing his earthbound part, and spirit, his higher part. And we will see that the struggle to be is a struggle between man's higher and lower self. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The Genesis man is made of two parts, earth and breath. Earth gives him form, breath animates him. The San Marco mosaics dedicate a separate scene to each of these parts. In the first, Adam is shown as an inanimate shape, like a figure formed of clay. In the second, God animates Adam with the breath of life. That man would be made of earth and spirit means two forces cohabit within him. Earth will always tend to fall back to the ground. Spirit will always strive to rise. The cohabitation of these opposing forces epitomizes the relation between man's higher and lower selves. As our work deepens, this contrast gains practical meaning. We observe our centers not only from the point of view of how they function, but also in relation to our aim to be. In the tutorial on the mind and the heart, we saw that our intellectual and emotional centers could reflect the master. Now, with more definite knowledge of the lower functions, we can understand mind and heart with more precision. Let us begin with the mind. The verb reflect originates from Latin and means to think, meditate, and ponder. By thinking, our mind's eye envisions absent things, including consciousness. Although our consciousness fluctuates, in a moment of lesser consciousness, our mind can still remember that consciousness is a practical possibility, that we were previously more conscious, that we can make certain efforts to become more conscious, and that, depending on our consciousness, we will respond to stimuli differently. Thinking and concentrating intentionally upon a given subject requires directed attention. This means that it is the intellectual part of our intellectual center that reflects our king of diamonds. You reconstruct a certain form of thinking which you have in higher states of consciousness. You cannot keep a flash of consciousness unless your thoughts are in a certain form. Through study we learn to think differently. But how can we learn to feel differently? The mechanical part of the emotional center is automatic. The emotional part is reactive. Both are confined to a limited and familiar spectrum of emotions. New emotions would have to be introduced intentionally, which requires the intellectual part the king of hearts. We call the process of becoming emotionally engaged inspiration. The verb inspire also originates from Latin and means to fill with an animating, 
quickening or exalting influence. Inspiration charges us with new emotion and a connection with cosmoses greater than our own. With these more precise definitions, we see that the mind and the heart are the king of diamonds and king of hearts. Given their ability to reflect and be inspired, the king of diamonds and king of hearts can become invaluable supporters of our aim to be. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. The Genesis creation myth is followed by the temptation myth. This, as we saw in the tutorial on identification, is a mythological description of the fall from consciousness. The temptation episode concludes with a curse to each of the members involved. The serpent is cursed to be forever earthbound. In being so closely associated with dust, the earthly counterpart of man, the serpent is singled out as man's earthbound part, a part diametrically opposed to his heavenly aspirations. With our more definite knowledge of the lower functions, we can relate this part to the brain responsible for the physical well-being of the organism, the instinctive center. Moreover, judging by the temptation myth, the instinctive center does not oppose consciousness directly. It tempts the other centers, as the serpent subtly tempted Adam and Eve. This implies an intention behind its opposition, which, in turn, suggests a more specific part of the instinctive center, the part that would function with attention, or the king of clubs. In the previous tutorial, we mentioned that this part was more permanently alert, monitoring our environment and calculating potential threats or benefits. This means that the microcosmos has a permanent and intelligent earthbound element in its psychology, that guides its actions based on its aims of physical preservation. Spiritual progress, especially at the expense of physical comfort, goes against its grain. Therefore, the King of Clubs opposes our aim to be. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Once we harness our hearts and minds to our aim to be, our cosmos falls under pressure. Its two biblical counterparts draw towards their opposite origins. To keep our aim, our minds and hearts must keep pulling. Therefore, our work lies in nourishing our minds and hearts. We must continually find new knowledge and inspiration to keep our work alive. Which brings us to this week's exercise. To observe what inspires us to make effort. Is it reading a poem first thing in the morning? Is it breaking our workday with a 15-minute walk? We each know which food is good for our body. Let us find which food keeps our minds instructed and our hearts inspired so that they diligently reaffirm our aim to be, to separate between our lower and higher selves. <laughs>